Our mission is to completely replace the use of animals as a food technology by 2035. This is Pat Brown. He's a University of Chicago alumnus and the founder and CEO of Impossible Foods, a company that develops plant-based substitutes for meat products. It's one of my favorite things to do is to find a powerful enemy and take them on. Even if you haven't had an Impossible Burger, you've probably heard of them. With meat prices rising in this country and concerns over shortages, some people are, are looking for alternatives. Impossible Foods makes plant-based meat substitutes. They're impossible. Burger sold in restaurants like Burger King. This Whopper has no beef. That's impossible. Impossible Foods just announced it's launching its products at Walmart stores. It's a huge step for the company into the U.S. grocery space. But Pat Brown isn't just a business leader. He's a scientist and professor emeritus in the Department of Biochemistry at Stanford University. And he does not mince words about the impact he hopes to have on the meat industry. Our goal is to make those industries go away, just to be mm-hmm. clear. Mm-hmm. Okay, the most destructive technology in human history, we want to make it go away. Why are those industries so destructive? It is overwhelmingly responsible for the two greatest environmental threats that our planet has faced. Number one, relentless progression of catastrophic climate change or toward catastrophic climate change. And number two, a complete collapse of global biodiversity. From the University of Chicago Podcast Network, this is Big Brains, a show about the pioneering research and pivotal breakthroughs that are reshaping our world. On this episode, replacing the meat industry to help save our planet. I'm your host, Paul Rand. Becoming the CEO of a food technology company wasn't always the plan for Pat Brown. In fact, he spent most of his life in the lab. When I was uh, in the PhD program in biochemistry, my advisor was a guy named Nick Cazzarelli. I chose that lab because they were working on what I consider to be the the absolute most interesting scientific problem I could imagine, which was basically to understand the mechanism of an enzyme that takes circular DNA molecules and kind of twists them up. It was a sabbatical from the Department of Biochemistry at Stanford University that got Pat thinking about what greater impact he wanted to have. So I had a lot more freedom, and I basically just decided, okay, what's the most important thing I can do to make the world better? So is that literally the question you're asking yourself? You sit down and say, I'm going to find this. Yes, it's it's a big question, and it was obviously the most important thing I could do given my skill set, which is which is finite. But what I realized that actually, the most important problem that I could work on, the greatest threat that humanity has ever faced, is the catastrophic impact of our use of animals as a food technology. It's not surprising to hear that the meat industry is terrible for the planet. Most of us have been told that at one point or another. But calling it the greatest threat humanity has ever faced is quite a statement. So a lot of people, when they think about what's the contribution of, you know, animal agriculture to climate change, they're thinking about, okay, well, let's kind of tally up all the the current emissions. According to the UN, livestock production contributes almost 15 percent of the world's greenhouse gases. Which is more than the entire transportation system. You know, all, every form of transportation on Earth combined cars, buses, wow. trucks. The, the land used every year to support livestock comprises about 45 percent of the entire surface of Earth. OK, wow. It's crops to feed livestock, permanent pastures, rangelands and grazing lands that that are continually used for livestock. Now, what's the opportunity cost of that? If I could snap my fingers and make that industry disappear in this instant, the recovery of biomass on that land would effectively, over the next 30 years or so, pull out the equivalent of 22 years of fossil fuel emissions. 22 years of fossil fuel emissions. I'm sure a lot of climate scientists would love to get that time back. So we've got 15% from stopping emissions. We've got another 22 years worth of emissions nullified over the next 30 years. Then two of the greenhouse gases of which livestock are the primary sources and they're very potent greenhouse gases, more potent than CO2, are methane and nitrous oxide. Methane has a half-life of nine years. Nitrous oxide has a half-life of about 100 years, okay? Unlike carbon dioxide, they spontaneously decay, which means if you shut off the emissions, okay, 
you don't get now zero emissions. You get negative emissions because because those dry, those gases spontaneously decay. Mm. Industrial meat is also the single biggest cause of deforestation globally. In Brazil, farmers are deliberately setting forest fires, like the Amazon rainforest fires that you may have seen in the news. Cattle are the biggest single reason the trees are cleared. They're grazing on land that used to be forest. Brazilian beef is in big demand all over the world. So if you see smoke rising from the Amazon, that's the secondhand smoke from your burger. And there's more. Biodiversity is probably even worse. About one million species of animals and plants around the world are now at risk of extinction. For more than half of a century, the World Wildlife Fund and a consortium of more academic institutions have been tracking the total population of more than 4,000 animal species that have been selected to represent animal biodiversity on Earth. And as of two years ago in their last report, the total number of living wild mammals, wild birds, wild reptiles, wild amphibians, and wild fish living on Earth is less than a third what it was 50 years ago. Animals all over the world find their habitat threatened by human activities like unsustainable farming and pollution. So when I started college, there were three times as many total wild animals living on Earth as there are today. And it's almost entirely due to the use of animals and food technology. The industry also uses a huge amount of water. It takes more than 18,000 gallons of water to produce one pound of beef. That means that we need to make products that compete sufficiently well to remove the economic incentive for covering the planet with cows and all the impacts of that industry. Researchers say that cutting meat from our diets is the single biggest way we can reduce our individual impact on the planet. But there's a problem. The thing is that people love, it's they visceral. are so used to the, the pleasure and that, that they get every day from eating these foods that it feels too difficult to them mm. to make the decision to, to stop or, or significantly cut back. This was the central problem that Pat realized during his sabbatical. Years of activism and education to convince people to go vegetarian hasn't worked on a wide scale. Even people who fully understand the destructive impact of that industry. And I mean, when I went to the Paris Climate Conference five years ago, everybody acknowledged that this was a huge problem and they all went out and had steak for dinner. So, <laughs> right. so my feeling is, okay, well, th what that tells you is you're not going to solve the problem by educating people or by telling them what I just told you. Forget about that. And uh, governments aren't going to do it. So what I recognize, anyone who has a better idea, please tell me, was that pull the economic rug out from under this industry that's destroying our planet by competing in the marketplace. And so Impossible Foods was born. We need to do a better job of serving consumers by figuring out how to make foods that are more delicious, helpful, and affordable, and of course, much more sustainable. And that, as a biochemist, I thought, like, actually, that is completely doable, okay? Right. It's very hard, but it's doable. We can understand the molecular mechanisms that make these foods desirable and use that knowledge to figure out a way to produce foods that deliver those same values and pleasures way more sustainably. So that's what I decided to do. So let me tell you, getting ready for this, and I, I've enjoyed your product for years, not as a vegetarian or as a vegan, but as a true meat lover. You are the exact person that I'm dedicating the rest of my life to make happy. Pat insists that his product be referred to as impossible meat, not a vegetable protein substitute, but meat. And that's because his target consumers aren't vegetarians or vegans, they're meat eaters. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously that's what we have to do because, because we can't ask consumers to meet us halfway. Right. We have to focus on delivering and then over-delivering the things that they value. That's the only way you win in the market. And Pat believes that he has a fundamental advantage over the meat industry. They can't change their product. Meanwhile, he can bring all his knowledge as a Stanford biochemist to continually improve his recipe. It's why I know we're going to win this because, you know, it's like the first mechanized transportation, which is a locomotive, famously lost a race to a horse. But the point is it was never going to lose again because right. the horse wasn't going to get any faster 
And now you have a technology mm. that can be continually approved. The cow stopped working on this problem a thousand years ago, <laughs> okay. maybe 10,000 years ago. And um, it's never going to get really any better at this stuff. And that's our core advantage. After the break, how Pat Brown cracked the code on making plants taste like meat. If you're getting a lot out of the important research that's shared on Big Brains, there's another University of Chicago podcast network show that you should check out. It's called Capital Isn't. Capital Isn't uses the latest economic thinking to zero in on the ways that capitalism is, and more often isn't, working today. From the debate over how to distribute a vaccine to the morality of a wealth tax, Capitalism clearly explains how capitalism can go wrong and what we can do about it. Listen to Capitalism, part of the University of Chicago Podcast Network. If you like big brains, there's another show we think you should check out. It's called Trending Globally, and it's from the Watson Institute at Brown University. On it, they explore today's biggest policy challenges in new and surprising ways. From the psychology that drives political polarization to the history of vaccine hesitancy, you'll hear fresh takes on the issues that are shaping our world. You can find Trending Globally wherever you listen to podcasts. So let's go through. You, you, you came up with this idea that you you have to beat them in the market, which is a huge insight. And you've decided that you've got to crack the code of what makes meat taste good. And only if you figure that out are you going to solve this. What did you find out? What's the code? Meat is instantly recognizable by a meat eater, any kind of meat, whether it's from you know a toad or a, right, a right. cow. As different from anything from a plant. And there's a bunch of common characteristics, one of which is that when you cook broccoli, it gets mushy and warm. Right. When you cook um, meat, you get this rather spectacular explosion of flavor and aroma, where this thing, if tasted in the raw state, is relatively bland. And so I wanted to understand what it is about meat. And I had an idea what it was. And just to make a long story short, it's that meat, animal tissues, have very high amounts of a molecule called heme. Heme. If there's one thing at the center of the Impossible Foods Code, it's this. So heme is what makes your blood red, it's what carries oxygen in your blood. It's also an essential molecule for every living cell on Earth, okay, because it's part of the energy generating system of the cell. And it has multiple functions. It's also well known to biochemists. We didn't discover any of this stuff. One of the best catalysts known in nature. It's, for example, the business end of the enzymes in your body that are involved in synthesizing estrogen, testosterone, corticosteroids, the enzymes that metabolize caffeine in your body and metabolize drugs in your body. They all use heme as basically the catalytic element. Here's the thing. You have this category of foods. They're screaming at you, wow, we got lots of heme in them. You know heme is a great biological catalyst, mm -hmm. and the behavior of, of meat when you cook it screams catalysis, okay? Because basically, a lot of chemistry is happening fast. So we studied meat to try to understand the mechanism and discovered basically that 95% of the answer to why meat tastes categorically different from anything in the plant world is that heat. meat has lots of heme. Now, t tell me where you have found it, because it's interesting, where you've got the heme to produce in your products. Well, initially, I, I thought I had a brilliant idea, uh -huh. which was legumes have these structures on the roots called root nodules, which are basically they turn nitrogen from the atmosphere into fertilizer. So they're nitrogen fixing plants. And uh, these root nodules contain a heme protein called leg hemoglobin. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and high co concentrations of it, actually. So I thought, okay, I'm going to calculate how much leg hemoglobin is there in the root nodules of the U.S. soybean crop. And it was approximately as much uh, equivalent to the amount of the heme protein in meat and the entire meat supply in the U.S. So I thought, okay, great. Here's, here's a part of the soybean plant that no one values. We'll just harvest that, extract the leg he hemoglobin. That's how we'll get the heme protein for our, our meat. Well, I thought that was a brilliant idea, but actually was not such a great idea. But it took us maybe the better part of a year uh, spending time out in Midwest soybean fields, you know, digging up root nodules and 
using an inverted street sweeper to strip them off the roots and mm. but eventually decided that for a whole variety of reasons this was not going to be a scalable solution and at that point we decided okay we're going to um, express a heme protein in yeast by engineering the yeast cells to produce the heme protein the yeast cells by the way have their are completely able of making the heme molecule itself every cell has to be able to make heme pretty much or else they have to be able to scavenge it uh, every cell on earth including yeast but you need a specific kind of protein to hold that heme molecule so that it protects it from oxidation. And then when you cook, it, it unfolds and releases it and sets off this explosion of, of mm. chemistry. So we engineered yeast to express heme wow. protein. And, wow. and now we have yeast cells that are, are like world-class professional producers of a heme protein. It's extremely... <laughs> It's extremely sustainable. It's much lower That's environmental amazing. impact than harvesting the soybean roots and and uh, uh, scalable. All right. So in addition to the heme, tell me the other ingredients that are making up your hamburger-like product. So we had to understand what are the kind of biochemical mechanisms that account for juicing us? Right. What are the mechanisms that account for the textural transformations that meat undergoes when you cook it. And then what we did was we said, okay, where can we find a potentially scalable source of proteins or fats or whatever that enable us to, to match these characteristics? Our current product has soy protein as a major protein. And I'll just tell you a thing about soy protein that most people don't appreciate is that according to the kind of standards for, for measuring protein nutritional quality that the FDA uses and the World Health Organization uses and so forth. Soy protein, in terms of its protein quality, digestibility, amino acid composition, is better than beef protein. Interesting. So it's a higher quality protein source. Got it. We have other things. We have we have fat from sunflowers, and, you know, a particular strain of sunflowers, coconut oil, and a variety of other things that contribute to the flavor. One of the criticisms of plant-based alternatives to meat is that it's highly processed and high in sodium. And it's true that one serving of impossible meat contains 16% of the FDA's suggested daily value of sodium. And almost any nutritionist would tell you to try to cut down on processed foods as much as possible and focus on whole foods, like fruits and vegetables. Something to keep in mind, what we're trying to replace is not your kale and quinoa and lentil salad or whatever it is. Right. We're trying to replace ground beef from a cow. So the salient comparison in terms of nutrition is not with, you know, that salad, which if I were offer a current meat consumer, you know what? Instead of that juicy burger, how about eating this pile of lentils and quinoa? That's not the idea. But our product is has no cholesterol. It has lower saturated fat, lower total fat, lower calories than the mass market ground beef product. So that's the salient comparison. You've said a few times you think you can actually meaningfully impact this industry within 15 years. Where do you feel that you are on that path? Yeah, that's a really good question. Well, our sales of our product and so forth are going up very fast and the animal-based products are at best Declining. plateaued, you know, but we're very early stage. I mean, we're right now our share of the $11 billion U.S. ground beef market is less than 1%. So we have a long way to go, but we know where this ends, okay? Because the competition is not getting any better and we're getting better all the time. And we're just scrambling to keep up with the demand at this point. I think it's it's not going to be just a slow, steady erosion of their market. It's going to be effectively getting them to a tipping point. The U.S. beef industry is fragile. The, the average age of a beef farmer or rancher in the U.S. is 59 years old. Okay, hmm. What that tells you is young people with options don't choose that profession anymore. It's not very profitable. And if you just look at economic statistics, the median beef farm in the U.S. loses money in any given year. Um, the reason that, that the industry continues is that those that are on the, on the high end make enough money to make it profitable overall as an industry, but it's not thriving. Think of it this way. The fundamental economics of our, of our products are vastly superior to the animal counterparts. We use 125th the land. We use 1 the water. 
we use a twelfth of the fertilizer. We we use even a smaller fraction of the pesticides that go into producing beef. Okay, all the stuff that goes into the feed crops and and managing the cows. We use less labor growing the plants because. Right now, the feed crops are being turned very inefficiently into meat, and we turn them very efficiently into meat with essentially 100% conversion efficiency. A cow does it with 3% conversion efficiency. So that means we actually need less plant crops, and we need no uh, uh, farm labor managing animals. So all the economic inputs, including the labor, are far lower for the production process of an Impossible Burger than a regular burger. Which brings us to another criticism of Impossible Meat. It's more expensive than regular meat. The problem is we're building this starting from zero. The the incumbent industry has 100 years of investment in, in all their infrastructure and so forth, and a very sort of stable, predictable market, and in our case, you know, we're producing capacity and we're constantly growing into it, which means that, you know, you can't be 100% efficient when when you're building new capacity and then growing into it. But what I can say is that anyone who understands the basic economics knows that that at scale, we're going to be a lot less expensive, okay? We can't sell the product at, at a loss because we won't be around very long if we right. do that but we're driving the cost down and, and then we'll be able to compete on price. So that's number one. And we're not trying to screw consumers. We're, we're running our margins as thin as we can run them and still stay strong as a company. Well, you have pork on the market. You're working at a couple of others as well. What should we keep an eye out for here? Where do we see you going next? We have to make steak. Stay tuned. Can't wait. The next most destructive part of the industry is the dairy industry. So we have to make dairy products. Stay tuned. (laughs) But what I I can tell you also to understand how we're approaching this is we never have to make beef liver. We never have to make beef kidney, Mm -hmm. okay? Because we're going to be strategic about making products that compete against essential elements of the kind of economic foundation of these industries that are destroying our planet. Uh, and then maybe we'll decide to make beef liver just because we can. Okay. But we're still making discoveries, and we've made versions of products from three different animals that, in blind taste tests with hundreds of consumers, have been preferred over the animal versions of those products. They're not oh. on the market, and we're, we are actually always working. We're always working to make all those things which are already better than the cow version to make them even better still. Mm. And unlike the cow, we can. If you're getting a lot out of the important research shared on Big Brains, there's another University of Chicago Podcast Network show you should check out. It's called Not Another Politics Podcast. Not Another Politics Podcast provides a fresh perspective on the biggest political stories, not through opinions and anecdotes, but through rigorous scholarship, massive data sets, and a deep knowledge of theory. If you want to understand the political science behind the political headlines, then listen to Not Another Politics Podcast, part of the University of Chicago Podcast Network. Big Brains is a production of the UChicago Podcast Network. If you like what you heard, please give us a review and a rating. The show is hosted by Paul M. Rand and produced by me, Matt Hodap, with assistance from Alyssa Eads. Thanks for listening.